Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. My name is Mark. Here with me today, special guest, Sean McDonald. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, thanks for being on this. Uh, you are a game designer, and we're going to be talking about your history with, with board games, with modern board games, uh, your experience designing games, and specifically talking about designing for IPs, which is uh, something we haven't talked about on the podcast specifically before, so I think that'll be interesting. Before we get into that, as always, uh, this podcast is uh, supported by our Patreon supporters, uh, and if you would like to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer and get all kinds of fun rewards, like being able to watch our podcast being recorded live. So let, let's begin by going into your history with board games. What 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 got you interested initially in modern board gaming so i've always kind of uh had a foot in board games since i was a kid actually my cousins and my brother uh when i was young they would constantly be playing heavy strategic games at least heavy for me at the time such as axis and allies and uh my oldest cousin he would constantly be making his own games in fact if he ever submitted one he probably would have been pretty prolific by now <laughs> so it's like a good two decades ago but yeah, just that influence. And then as I grew up, I would always kind of get into it. I've always usually had friends that have been into board games. And uh, I kind of stopped for a while in my early 20s. And then I uh, got back in when a roommate of mine brought home HeroScape. So it was like a, like a more mainstream version of, I guess you could say, Warhammer, but not really. Uh, Minis combat game. And that kind of got me into it. And then we kind of started playing War, uh, Risk, got into Risk again. Kind of, Kind of like I revisited it again. And started to fall in love with it again. And from there, I just kind of kept playing off and on for years. And then probably in the last seven or eight years, I've kind of gone fully into it again. So it's always kind of been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, it sounds like you were, your history, at least when you were younger, is is very much in the kind of Ameritrash games, you know, Risk, oh, yeah. Heroes yeah. game. Do, do you still, is that kind of still the games you gravitate towards? I still, uh, I've noticed that i've i've have a lot of euro games my wife especially enjoys games like um non-confrontational games but i've noticed i've gotten to a point now where i think i need to get back into confrontational games because <laughs> i kind of get i kind of get a kick out of it there's something about it that you just don't get from the euro games so yeah i think i would lean heavily more towards games of conflict um any any particular games that you're really liking at the moment Ooh, I gotta look at my shelf. I kind of uh, I keep a regular rotation. I always I trade often. I got Clank in space, so the space version of Clank. I've been kind of digging that one. I know that one's not super heavy conflict, but more probably more so than than your usual Euro games. See here, oh, uh, Mr. Jack. I discovered that game is like a ten to me. I just love that that oh, game. Oh, nice. <laughs> so I would say there's always a constant rotating door of board games that I'm playing, so it's hard to. To keep up, I, I I have a bad habit of trading in games often just to try the new thing. So, ah, that seems that seems good. It's it's uh, it's cost effective and, and space efficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. As I'm discovering, I've got I, I got to figure out how to physically store all the games I have at this point. Yeah, uh, Mr. Jack, that's a that's a hidden movement game, right? Yes, it is. But uh, yeah, that was. Uh, I think uh, Asmodee probably picked up the rights to that at this point. But it's it's to me, it's like a modern classic. And then, so you're into board games, and at some point, you you decide to start designing games. Was that pretty early on, kind of fiddling with design, or is that something that you arrived that you wanted to do later on? I got into it through. So initially, I was always into to the concept of design my own game. It was actually a lot of people like use risk as their kind of point of like, I think I could do this better, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's got to be a way. And I hated the dice rolling element of risk. <laughs> I just despise it. I was like the, that one guy that says dice hate me. Every time I roll, I just, I, I could have this massive army and go against like one guy and get taken down. And that just always bugged me. So I was like, there's got to be a way to design a board game like risk, but without the dice rolling. And of course I had no idea the, the board game industry was where it was at at that point, even, even decades ago. But I would say that the main pivotal thing that got me back into really designing and designing professionally is the game crafter. Mm. So that site just started. I think I was like a year old when I discovered it. And I just was, that was kind of like, Oh, I can actually physically make a game. It's actually, the price was very reasonable. 
for like a one-time print on demand kind of website. And from there, I learned about Kickstarter and crowdfunding. And uh, that's sort of where I did uh, a couple of games. I crowdfunded a couple of games. One was like very like early game crafter, no no actual chit board or anything, just just like thick card stock and stuff like that. And it was pretty low quality, but it was just somewhere at like a starting point. And then I kind of did a major game after the game crafters components improved. And I uh, actually, I think I ended up going t- to China for that one after the fact, because it funded a little bit better than I expected. So that's sort of where I started was through the game crafter, basically just kind of fiddling around with the components and going from there. And then what what was that that game that that funded well? Uh, so it was called Train Heist. It was my I would consider that my first real published board game. I self published it and it did well for what I was expecting, anyways. And then after that, uh, my board game, my local friendly local board game store, had the manager. He took my game because it was actually selling well for him. Took my game to the New York Toy Fair with him and actually started shopping it around to publishers himself. Uh, unbeknownst to me <laughs> and uh <laughs> he told he told me he handed it over to a couple publishers and i was like oh that's cool and i didn't think anything of it because the game already kickstarted right so i assume no publisher would be interested but uh eventually cryptozoic got back to me uh they were very interested and we kind of went from there so that's sort of where it all began really it just kind of fell through the cracks <laughs> tell me about that game how does that what kind of game so, is is that so when I designed that game, I literally, it sounds bad, but it was almost like a corporate approach. I was like, what is a popular board game <laughs> and what can I do to kind of like make that game? And right at that moment, of course, Pandemic was probably at its climax of popularity. And so I was like, I want to make a co-op game, but not Pandemic, but kind of Pandemic. And sort of, sort of like Pandemic, but a li- maybe a little bit more, right? It's like a little more rules or something to it. And so the game is actually a, a train heist game that uh, you cooperatively rob the train together Mm -hmm. and uh, as the game goes on the train gets faster and faster and it's kind of like a Robin Hood steal from the rich give to the poor kind of theme so what you're doing is you're robbing from the train and then delivering to the city to the poor townsfolk before the train arrives to come get there the sheriff comes and gets his kickbacks from the townsfolk right so it's kind of like this machine that you have to keep feeding as it gets faster and faster so yeah, it's a really it's a basic game, but honestly, like my first design, I would say I could probably cut the rules in half now with what I know now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, that's that's usually the case with first time designs. It sounds like self publishing was kind of where you're going from the start. There, uh, yeah. did you did you ever think about not doing that, to, to trying to get it more traditionally published, or uh, yeah. were you gung ho for Kickstarter from the start? So what happened with, with Train Ice, um, it got published through Cryptozoic, and they actually offered uh, to comp me a hotel room at Gen Con to come help promote the game. And this was Gen Con 50, the 50th uh, Gen Con. And mm-hmm. so I went down, and I was like, I'm going to make the most of this trip, because I'm up in here in Canada. It's a big trip. I think it was like <laughs> the cheapest flight. I ended up with, with uh, like two two uh, transfers it was like 12 hours oh man of, of travel time to get to indianapolis it's not a, not it's not like a common trip to, uh, up here in canada so i went i made my way down there and of course i was like i have a few designs maybe while i'm there i'll make the most of my time and when i'm not working with cryptozoic at their booth i was i would go make some appointments prior and, and uh, shop it around and so i had a little racing game and this is kind of an interesting point of view because uh the first IP game I made was not made with that IP in mind, Mm -hmm. which I think is something that designers should note is that it was it was actually brought upon me. They said they pulled me aside and basically said, what do you think about this IP? And of course, my eyes got really big, but uh, we can talk about that later if you want. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk about that game then. So you had you had a game idea. What did that end up becoming? So I had basically, uh, it was a, I, I, I entered a contest at the Game Crafter. It was for a map, a map building game. And I made a map building game. I thought it would be interesting to make a map building game that was a racing game. And you designed the track while you were racing on it. And that was sort of the strategy of the game. Hmm. And eventually that kind of turned into a, uh, I wouldn't say like a Mario Kart style game, but kind of. It was like a strategic, like turn-based Mario Kart kind of thing, but with map building as the main mechanic. And uh, eventually, they I went to 
make a bunch of appointments. Eventually, I came across IDW and uh, Daryl Andrews, prolific designer from Canada. He was contracted out by IDW at the time to kind of do a vetting process for games for IDW. And uh, he kind of made contact. And then eventually I talked to some guys in IDW and they kind of pulled me in the back. And Spencer Reeve, who works at IDW, he kind of, uh, I can't remember who was looking at it, but he called Spencer over and he said, uh, what do you think about, he's like, what do you think about Sonic the Hedgehog for this game? <laughs> and of course, my eyes got big. And then he looked at the guy, turned and looked at me and he's like, you didn't hear anything. <laughs> so at the time... At the time, of course, nobody had any idea that they had the license for uh, and IDW, of course, does comics. They eventually took over the Sonic comic from uh, the Archie comics. And so this was all kind of new information. No one really heard anything about this yet at the time. So it was kind of interesting. So my eyes got wide and I left the game design with them. Basically, the usual spiel of you leave it, leave it with the publisher, you hear back in maybe a couple months or a couple weeks even. And initially, it was actually a rejection. So Daryl Andrews said he couldn't see how the theme could be tied to the game. Mm -hmm. And so what I said back was, give me two weeks. <laughs> I was really pushy about it. I said, give me two weeks and I'll show you how this could potentially be a Sonic the Hedgehog game. And basically, I, I think it was like four days and I sent them back a whole package with the art completely redone. I have some background in graphic design and uh, just completely tied to, to Sonic in every way possible that I could think of. And uh, of course they did a complete 180 after that point. And long story short, the game eventually came out as a Sonic board game. I never designed a game and I don't, all, most of what I understand of the publishing world is just from this podcast and talking to yeah. people in, in, in a little bit on social media and such. But from what I understand, like when a company has an IP, they typically reach out to someone first and then mm -hmm. have them make a game specifically for that ip did it did it seem like even from their perspective what they were doing in in terms of picking up a game and then retrofitting the ip onto it and altering it was did that feel a bit unusual i think it's because it was the right game at the right time like i said i, yeah. I feel like everything that happened to me in this industry i kind of fell through the cracks <laughs> i was just in the right place at the right time with mm -hmm. the right game uh, I don't think that's something they would normally do. That said, um, I remember, I can't remember, it might have even been Daryl Andrews, but he said there was a time where you don't really design a board game with an IP in mind because the odds of that happening are, uh, of that happening are not going to happen. You know what I mean? But yeah, now yeah. he said, now he said, you said, go ahead <laughs> and make the game with the IP in mind because if it's good, there's actually a pretty good chance the whoever has the rights at that moment in time will seriously look at the game. So it was kind of interesting. So I just kind of had basically a Sonic-like game already, just without the IP attached. That said, the next IP game, so Sonic did well, mm -hmm. uh, and IDW came to me and did it the way that you suggested, where they had the IP in mind, and I designed it from the ground up with that next IP in mind. So I've done it both ways. Yeah, we'll talk about that that in a moment. Uh, sure. Specifically about the the Sonic game, uh, I'm curious what you did to transition it into that setting. What, what were the yeah. changes you made? So uh, basically, I, I turned the the racetrack into Green Hill Zone from the Sonic. So my version, my vision of Sonic, and thankfully they had. I didn't realize this, but Sonic's almost separated into two separate IPs now. When you license stuff out, there's modern Sonic and classic Sonic. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So they, mine was in the classic Sonic universe, and thankfully that's the only Sonic I really know is from the Genesis. And of course, Sonic Mania was a good game that came out recently, but like the 2D classic Sonic. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just looked and immediately went back to. I tried to absorb the nostalgia of it and approach it from a nostalgic point of view. These are like, like approach all the tropes of Sonic. So what would someone expect to see in a Sonic game that is like me, who has a very strong admiration for the classic games so i would expect to see tails knuckles dr eggman you know what i mean the, the the standard characters i would expect to see like jumps and bumpers and springs and boosters and all that stuff and so a lot of the items that were in my game translated pretty much one to one over to those items uh, what you do in the games you can actually get items and then lay them on the course to become like permanent features that everyone can use so what will happen is you can put a spring down 
and the spring will let you jump over any amount of obstacles in succession in a row, including players. So a player could use that, and then the next player behind them could also use it kind of thing, right? So it gives everyone a chance behind you to also uh, benefit. So little things like that, like everything kind of translated over. I was really fortunate, actually. Some things, uh, like there's some attack items that I kind of had to think a little more outside the box because Sonic isn't really, like, he has this spin dash, but you can't really encapsulate that into an item, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the items that did damage, I took some bad guys that you expect. So, like, the Goomba of Sonic is, like, the Crab Meat and the Buzz Bomber and the Moto Bug. Those are, like, the the original trinity of, of grunt bad guys in Sonic games. So I just kind of incorporated those guys into part of the track or some of the items, such as the offensive items. Interesting. And I'm curious more about this concept because I haven't played the game, but the idea of like building the track as you go, how does that actually work from a gameplay perspective? Do people Uh, get like turns laying the track down or? Yeah. So what will happen is the person at first has control of how the track is, is designed. It's, it's simple. It's simple, but I'm going to try and explain this to the best of my ability. (laughs) So what will happen is there'll be two to start the game. For example, there'll be two tiles out with track on it. And once you move off of that, you can draw from uh, there's two tiles kind of exposed two stacks. You can kind of pick from those two stacks what tile you want to go in next. And there'll usually be a straightaway or a corner with some obstacles on it. And it's not terribly complicated. But what happens is whenever you do that, you get a victory point, basically, which is a flicky bird. So those are the little birds that you save in the, the classic Sonic game. So th- basically, every time you create a part of the track, you collect uh, a victory point. So the finish line is effectively, once you get, say, five flicky birds, and then you move off the last tile and play, you win. However, someone behind you might have four flicky birds. So if they keep going, the track continues, and so does your finish line, right? It gets further away from you. So it's kind of like a victory point-based racing game based on designing the track. And of course, there's catch-up mechanisms the, how the track is designed, it might seem pretty simple the way I explain it, but what happens is that you can make shortcuts if the from one completed track tile to another, depending on how the track is laid out. And those shortcuts are, of course, like a loop-de-loop and like a little tunnel from Sonic. And basically, the player at first is trying to hold on to their lead by designing the track in a way that would counter players further behind to be able to use these shortcuts because they can be pretty massive. Uh, catch-up mecha- mechanism if you're smart enough and play it well. So uh, it's a combination of the first player trying to design the track to impede the other players, but at the same time, the other players have a few different catch-up mechanisms that allow them to get back into first place. So I kind of designed it to be neck and neck uh, if you play smart. All right, let, let's talk about the next game then. That's the that's the game that is uh, yet to be released. Yeah. What can you tell me about that one? <laughs> um, I'll tell you as much as I think I can tell you. Uh, so the next game is bomb, uh, based in the Bomberman IP. Oh, cool. And that was that was a huge deal when they came to me. First of all, it was very humbling and flattering that they came to me after Sonic because they really, really enjoyed Sonic. So they came to me with the Bomberman IP and of course my eyes got even bigger because I don't think they're... They didn't know, but I don't think there's a... It's probably one of my top five biggest video game, most influential video games in my life is oh, Bomberman. Oh, cool. Man. Very played nice. A ton. Yeah, I played a ton of Bomberman growing up on the Super Nintendo and uh, Turbo Graphics, and of course in all the various consoles coming up I played, and I own Bomberman R currently for the Switch. So it's actually specifically based on the Bomberman R license, so I guess they're just very, you know, it's a very specific license that they picked. That said, it's still just going to be a Bomberman board game, right? So in designing that game, when they approached me with that, this was the first time I ever had uh, a contract in the sense that I had a time limit. <laughs> they said, this is the contract. This is how much time till we can see this product. You know what I mean? You need to keep us up to date with what it is and this and that and what your idea is. And they kind of came to me with an idea as well, where they effectively wanted it to be very basic. Because Bomberman, of course, is... Well, they said effectively, like, they, you, you should be able to move and lay a bomb, right? That should be <laughs> the game. But, of course, I know better. Bomberman isn't just about moving and laying a bomb, right? But I wanted to make it as simple as that. So I made a – effectively, I was like, I, there's a, there are a list of things. I approached this very much with the IP in mind. There's a list of things that you need to have in a Bomberman game. And so while I won't explain the game 
uh, directly because I think IDW is actually going to reveal this pretty soon in the next few months. But uh, like, are you familiar with Bomberman? I, I've played it years ago, like the original yeah. one. It's, it's it's just the multiplayer combat thing, mm-hmm. right? There's no yeah. other part to the game, right? Uh, there are some single player games. Okay, I'm not yeah, familiar it, with that. I'm familiar with the multiplayer, like yeah. You're stuck in this maze and, you know, trying yeah. to navigate the corridors and then and, and place stuff strategically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it's famous for, really, is it's multiplayer. So I was determined to have a list of things such as the getting the items that you when you blow up the block, of course, you need to get the items and kind of build up your character and strengthen them. Kind of like that power fantasy of getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Right. Mm-hmm. So that had to be in the game. I also had to have all those little extra items that were in the game, like punch and kick and all, you know, and and remote bomb and all those other fun items. But I was like, I had to do it in a way that still kept the game simple. So I think I did that. I also had the challenge of, you can't just really one-to-one. I tried to make this very faithful to Bomberman, but you can't really one-to-one it to a board game because a round of Bomberman is like two to five minutes. (laughs) Right. And right, and so like if you're just in your little corner of the map, slowly blowing your way to the center, that could take like 20 minutes before you even encounter someone, right? So I had to make it interesting right from the get-go, and strategy needed to begin right from the get-go, but in a way that was still Bomberman. You still needed to be able to collect items slowly and build up, right? So I think I found an effective way of doing that. I hope people, when the game's revealed, they check it out and see what I tried to do, but basically I tried to make a lot available to you right away, but at the same time, you're kind of closed off. I also needed to make it so that you could blow yourself up by accident. If you were, Oh yes. I remember doing that (laughs) when I played like the one time I played, I I blew myself up a lot. (laughs) And if you are careless in this game, you will blow yourself up or someone can manipulate things in such a way that your own bomb blows yourself up. Uh, I also wanted you to be able to trap players, but that was another thing that you couldn't really translate one to one because it's effectively like a lose a turn if you trap someone. Mm -hmm. So I tried to make it so there's still something they can do that uh, is satisfying and strategic or tactical in a way. But at the same time, you could trap someone. (laughs) So I had to have that balance, right? And then, of course, this game is about it's a battle royale, right? Last man standing. So how can you make a game? It's a big faux pas to make player elimination in modern board games with the exception that they're eliminated maybe within the last five minutes of the game or so right because then it's not as big of a deal when the game's almost over so i had to make basically kind of pretty much that Mm -hmm. (laughs) i made it so that there you can get blown up and you need to be able to blow up people a lot it's a board game it's not like like i said it's not like the video game where you get to blow up things a lot in the board game it's it's kind of turn-based so you have to you, know, you want to have that satisfaction of blowing a player up, but the game not immediately being over. So each player can take more than one hit, effectively. But there will be a, a, bo- a way to bounce back from that as a player that gets hit, which will you'll maybe see in the game as it gets revealed. And uh, I made it so that you can get eliminated, but as I said, it's probably within the last five minutes of the game when things are kind of at a climax, mm-hmm. unless you're absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> in which case... Go put, you know. And yeah, it was just, a, it was kind of sobering because it's, I take the franchise very seriously. I know a lot of people, like Barman is big in, in, in North America, but it's, it's actually really big in Japan. And um, I wanted to, not that I were heavily focusing on the Japanese market, but my Sonic game ended up in Japan. So, I, you know, you never know. So I just wanted to make sure I really did a sobering justice to this franchise by having a list of all the things you'd expect and all the feelings you would have in a Bomberman game while still being interesting and having interesting decisions and still being a board game and embracing the fact that it's a board game. Was it difficult to have it work and and capture that feeling while being turn-based? Because what I remember from Bomberman is that like it gets really fast-paced yeah. Uh, in, in the video game, what were the challenges there in making a turn-based game? So uh, I'll reveal a little bit about this game. I don't think I'll get in too much trouble. But <laughs> I initially I initially went with, um, I toyed with action programming. So everyone's moves kind of took off at the same time. And it didn't quite work. It wasn't, it was too random. You know what I mean? With a game like um, Colt Express, which is an action programming game, you're kind of on a 2D plane, really, the way you play. Mm-hmm. But Bomberman, you have so many different directions you can go that it was almost too free. 
And so it was really hard to like predict people's movements and it just became very random and very not fun. So we ended up going with turn-based and I kind of found a system where the bombs would blow up in a way that was fair. Uh, and that took a while and it's very simple uh, when you guys see the game, but that actually took a long time to figure out to get the bombs to blow up in a way that felt fair, that you could see it coming. And if you blew up, it was kind of your own fault. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was, that was the big challenge. So I tried really hard when I first did this game, I had like a really small arena <laughs> and I was like, this game has to be fast. This game has to be fast. And that was really going into it, what I was desperately trying to do. And at the end of the day, I couldn't capture the feeling of of Bomberman and have it be five minutes long. It was just, it wasn't possible in a board game format. Like you could make like a a game of war with bombs in it and say, put slap Bomberman on it. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. say (laughs) that I just didn't want to go that route. And neither did IDW, to be honest, they had a specific plan for it. So I embraced the, the the turn-based board game format, but the game is about, I would say, 20 to 30 minutes. So it's not terrible by any means, but it, it, it captures the speed in that you don't move. So this is the part I will reveal, which isn't a big deal. I think it's pretty much out there. But uh, you don't move space by space in the game. Uh, your Bomberman moves like a rook in chess. Oh. Yeah, and so as long as you're not impeded, you can move in a complete straight line. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I kind of captured the the speed of the game in that your movement is really unlimited to, you know what I mean? With the exception of bombs and blocks. And you just have a certain amount of that move you can do. And so that was sort of how I captured, like, I don't like the one, you know, I've always tried to think of more unique ways to move in a board game. I've never liked the one space at a time kind of thing. Yeah, it ends up being really slow most, yeah. in most cases. So in this case, you can, at some point, as the game the game naturally climaxes and more blocks are moved. Bomberman are moving. Uh, not only is their speed increasing, so the way you increase speed is you just get more moves rather than getting to move more, like further. Mm-hmm. So such as when you get a roller skate. So as the game progresses, everyone can move almost everywhere <laughs> uh, with the exception of like obstacles, right? So you could just run right past someone and lay bombs on either side of them. And uh, and that could be like one move. You can lay bombs freely anywhere along where you've moved as long as you have the bombs for it. So that was sort of my way of capturing the speed. And of course, the player isn't completely helpless. It got captured. They have a way out as well, potentially. So depending on uh, the strategy that's laid in front of them. But that's the part I won't reveal. <laughs> <laughs> sure. What was the biggest challenge with this design? Yeah, I would say, honestly, it was um, it was the bombs themselves because in Bomberman the bombs don't just blow up immediately of course they have a little countdown right but in a turn-based game uh, how do you do a countdown that doesn't slow the game down or make it too obvious how to avoid the bombs right so I think the big challenge was really trying to capture that feeling of Bomberman but in a turn-based format and of course the speed I was just like oh I was trying so hard to get that speed the game really fast <laughs> mm-hmm while still capturing all the, the checklist of things you need in a Bomberman game. So it was a constant juggling act. And I think I did good. And I hope in my heart of hearts that people play it and they don't say it's too long. Because <laughs> I feel like when you play it, you don't feel like it's too long. But when you hear that it's a Bomberman board game and it could be like 30 minutes, that's when you're kind of shrug, right? So, But I feel like when you're in the moment playing it, it doesn't feel like it's this drawn out version of a Bomberman video game. In terms of the experience of kind of designing a game with these kind of restrictions, right? So it's tied to a theme, it's tied to an IP. Uh, you mentioned that IDW had some kind of initial ideas of, of how they wanted it. Do you enjoy that process of having kind of outside restrictions being placed on your design from the beginning? Or does it feel more limiting to you in a way that you don't enjoy? It's kind of weird, but I love I love it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I love the restriction and the challenge, and it kind of allowed me to really hunker down and get get this design done in a way that was very satisfying to me. And they say like uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So when you have restrictions, you start to come up with really unique ideas that you probably wouldn't have bothered to made the effort to if you had complete and utter freedom. So it was it was interesting trying to capture Barman in a way that was presented to me, uh, how they wanted the game. And I kind of really enjoyed that, to be honest. 
it's always interesting how publishers have to um, interact with the licensor mm-hmm. because it's not just uh, it's not the same every time, right? It's different, and it's been different working with Konami, who owns Barman, as it was with with Sega. So it's interesting, and they do have a say in how they get to look at the game, and they have a say in some of the stuff. And they, there has been change, like Sonic had some changes based on Sega's uh, suggestions. So it's interesting working both with the publisher and the license holder to make something that satisfies both of them. And it kind of adds an extra vetting process too, which is always a good thing. Is this something you would like to continue doing in terms of your career with design? Is yeah. is getting an IP and then working within that kind of now what you are looking yeah. forward to? I think so. I kind of, I feel like I carved out a little niche and uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. It's working for me. That said, I'm going to probably slow down a little bit on design unless I get approached by a publisher. Like if any publishers are interested that are listening to this and you have an IP and you think I would do it justice, feel free to approach me. But I would like to continue to do it. But I'm, I think for a little bit, I got to hunker down. Of course, this isn't my livelihood, my my real career. I'm kind of doing a career transition right now. So I'm going back to school for some things. Mm-hmm. So things are probably going to slow down a little bit. But uh no, I love this. If the, if people keep coming to me for work and they have a little IP game they want to get done and they need it done in a reasonable amount of time and they like my work, then, yeah, I would love to continue doing this. And it seems like, at least in the past couple of years, outside of, like, there's always been games, at least when I've been in the board game community, there's always the major super big IPs. Like, there's always been Star Wars games as far yeah. as I've been around. But... I'm seeing more and more, like IDW is doing a lot of IP games. You have Prospero Hall is now doing, like, just based, they, they released one based on the movie Jaws. Like, it's not a huge yeah. IP, but it's it's recognizable. And, and I'm yeah. noticing that those are the games that are more frequently getting in stores that other hobby games can't, right? So I, I went to Target the other day for something, and I'm like, oh, I'll check out the board game section. And it's all these... IP games that I've kind of vaguely heard of, but they're hobby games. Like they have the trademarks of, of what we see in our community in terms of design. Do you see that it's just going to increase in terms of how many games connected to IPs are, are going to be created? Yeah. So I actually have, I, I, I listen to a lot of uh, industry stuff and I, I have a lot of respect for a lot of people in the industry and what they're talking about and i'll get to to what you're saying but what i was trying to say is the industry is kind of in a weird place right now Mm -hmm. they keep some people saying like a recession i don't know if that's the right word for it but uh, effectively there's a lot of games on the market some say too many games Mm -hmm. and it's not that the market isn't being satisfied it's that designers like me it's becoming less and less worth it (laughs) you know what i mean when your game no matter how good it is it's over people are over it in two weeks right so that that's sort of where the crash is starting to happen. That combined with distributors only taking maybe like a third of what they used to, because there's always a constant flow of games that games are losing that uh, long tail. And so I actually think IP games are a very safe place to be right now in the the current state of the industry, because it's a combination of that appeal of having the IP attached to it that gives it a bit of a longer tail in that. Board gamers will probably play it and you know and poop it out in two weeks, but your I, the people that maybe don't play board games as much, they'll keep find, discovering it in stores, you know, and buying it and discovering it and buying it, and that's sort of what's happened with uh, with Sonic, right? It's had a pretty good, pretty good sale record so far. So, and of course with the movie coming out, that'll probably help a little bit. But oh yeah, that's true. I I think IP. I think it was a uh, there's a designer slash publisher of Portal Games, uh, Ignacy Trevichek. Mm-hmm. I think that's his name. Uh, he was saying he doesn't know. This is the first time where he's felt he doesn't know where the industry is heading right now. What's the next thing kind of thing? Like sometimes it was roll and write games for a while. And then, you know, some people think it's like, oh, like nature or like inoffensive themes kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I kind of think that IP games are going to be a bigger thing in the next couple of years in that they're going to get better. And then they're, they're going to start to become contenders in maybe the top hundred on board game geek. So that's sort of my opinion. I think IP games are both a safe a safe bet and also could increase the tail lifespan of a game. So that's sort of my two cents. 
Yeah, and board games seem to be one of the few media that more consistently than like movies, for instance, are able to take IPs from other media and make something good. <laughs> like, you know, like, especially coming from like video games, right? So like it, video game movies are notorious for just consistently being awful. But yeah. I mean, you look at board games inspired by video games and they're generally well received or, or board games yeah. inspired by movies or, or television shows or things like that. They're typically well done. I think I think a lot of that is that there's less hands in the cookie jar, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> oh, less executives interesting. Saying yeah, yeah. this is what kids like, kind of thing, and it's more passionate nerd fans that are actually genuine fans of whatever the the IP is, right? So sometimes when you have more people involved, right, you get something like that original version of Sonic that was for the movie there. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it just, with the, just the creepy human eyes. It. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah there's that disconnect that's it's a larger disconnect when you have big companies handling IPs I think so when you have a smaller company handling an IP it's usually they do it more justice yeah 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 that makes sense to me uh, is there is there a dream IP you'd love to work with something oh, at the top uh, of the list I am a, even though I did a Sonic game I am a Nintendo fanboy through and through and if Nintendo gave me anything <laughs> oh yeah they were willing to slum it with me I would love to actually take the Sonic game because it was originally inspired by mario kart i would love to like do a, a redo kind of the rules a bit and refine it a bit and do a mario kart uh board game oh that'd be a oh, dream now i'm thinking of nintendo because I, I was also more into nintendo yeah like, have, like has there ever been a zelda game like bo a zelda uh, board game yes it, it's an older one and it's uh you can look that up i think but there has been one on you can check it on board game geek but mm -hmm. It's an older one from like the Milton Bradley era, of, you know, the big long box board games. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, there hasn't been, Nintendo has been very, well, the thing is, Nintendo has been very protective of their IPs until recently, and they've kind of opened up the doors again, and right, uh, we're getting like a Nintendo theme park in Japan this year, I think, and there's like a Mario, there's apparently a Mario movie being produced right now, and so they've kind of opened up again to the idea of selling their 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 IPs to to things like that. So I would love, and I mean, uh, I think, uh, what's it called? USAopoly, or I think they're called the Op now. They have some, they have like Mario Brothers license, and it's just like a really basic game. But I would love for Nintendo to kind of take a risk and go with someone like IDW that just does a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. just take something like Pikmin or something, you know, and just make a really cool strategy co-op game out of it or something. Oh, so, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm stuck on this like Zelda epic adventure game. <laughs> that'd be that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I would love that. I would love so it. Nintendo, Anything if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nintendo, call me. Yeah, uh, Sean yeah. McDonald. I'll I'll do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Look at that. He'll do you. it for free. Yeah, I'll pay you. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. that'd be a dream. Any other game designs you are you're working on that you uh, are planning to work on something uh, further out beyond the Bomberman game? I've always got some weird stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know if you can, I should just, here, give me two seconds and I'll just show you something. Oh, sure, yeah. Stupid. yeah. So, this is a stupid game that I was kind of toying with. <laughs> These are the dumb ideas. Like, there's constantly like a dozen dumb board games I'm working on. But I was kind of toying with the idea of a dexterity game. Mm -hmm. So what I have here is a little frying pan with a die in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're trying to flip it to get it on each of the sides before your opponent does. And I haven't really, I'm just kind of toying with this dumb idea of like trying to act like you're cooking a die and trying to get it on all, all the six sides. And like That's someone, great. you have like a second player writing something down depending on the die roll. And I was just kind of toying with that. But like dumb ideas like that. <laughs> Dumb ideas are good, actually, in the board game industry in weird ways. So, like, goofy stuff that makes you feel like a child kind of thing. Those oh, are yeah. always good. Yeah. I had another game I am working on. I've been kind of toying with it off and on, but it's another co-op game. I wanted to make it so it, uh, it was like a, a conspiracy wall uh, where you're, like, there's buildings blowing up. And they're kind of, you know, in, like, the old campy detective movies, they see, like, on the crime map, there's a pattern. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like conspiracy wall. Kind of thing. I kind of wanted to make a game where by the time you're done, there's kind of a conspiracy wall 
that's pointing to like whoever the culprit is. And I'm kind of toying with a game like that right now. That one's difficult though. <laughs> that sounds and, really cool. You mean like with, little... like the maps and they got like the string going between yeah. pictures and stuff, yeah. that kind of thing. It's, it's difficult to make it not fiddly, but also sure. make it feel like you're like solving this, this, this conspiracy or this crime. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of toying with that. And then there's uh, one of their, there's a bunch of weird games, but there's uh, one that's like a spaceship dexterity game where you're trying to open up little doors on the spaceship. And then <laughs> it's really stupid. I doubt I'll pursue this one, but you're trying to tilt it so that the aliens that are kind of invading the ship get sucked out the door, but your guys and your cargo don't. So you're kind of like sliding them out the door of the spaceship <laughs> and then you stop and then you'll actually move around the spaceship like a normal board game. And then there'll be another phase where the door opens and everything gets sucked out of it. So <laughs> just little dumb games like that. But I enjoy doing it, <laughs> even if it never comes to fruition. That's great. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? In No, no. The, I would the say, uh, like I said, if anyone uh, is interested in doing IP games, uh, I think you should just make the game. To me, the worst case scenario, you just make an off-brand you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you just transition of that IP and something people are legally really, distinct. <laughs> yeah, and pe- people are still really into that. And there's been a lot of games in board game history that had success with that and even had an IP and then had to have it removed and still continue to be in print. So uh, I say go for it. You know, re- do your research uh, who has the IP and what kind of games they usually publish if you really want to get it published. But I'd say go ahead and make that uh, dream game you want to make. That's great. Well, thanks for being on the podcast, Sean. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, you're, you're on Twitter? Yeah, you can just reach me. Honestly, Twitter's probably the best. So I'm just at Tower Guard Games. It's my little publishing company uh, that I'm my – comp- my company's name, basically, that mm-hmm. I work under. So Tower Guard Games. Fantastic. Thanks again. This was a really interesting peek into part of designing I haven't really looked into before. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com. Again, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks again, Sean. This was a blast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.